Okay, Art, I think we're live now, so you're all very welcome here for um, Donal Hall's talk this afternoon, or this evening, I should say. Um, my name is Shee Fraken, um, and I'll be sharing the panel today, so I have the, the easy job, I suppose. Um, and just to introduce myself, first of all, before I introduce Donal, um, I'm from RD, um, and I recently completed a PhD on the Irish Civil War, which is coming out next year as a book, um, Spiritual Wounds, Trauma Testimony and the Irish Civil War. So I have a strong interest in the revolutionary period and I'm currently um, lecturing in the Irish Language Department in Queen's in Belfast. So just moved up a little bit north of the border. So that would be relevant, I suppose, for what Donald will be talking about today. And um, so I'm really um, excited to introduce Donald. I know from my perspective, Donald's work has been really, really important in opening up the history of Loud. And I actually we have a copy of Donald's book here, which is a must um, for anyone who doesn't have it. But obviously, that's only one of a number of his publications. He's also editor of the, the edited collection, County Loud and the Irish Revolution. Very recently produced a, a book on RD and the Revolution, which I know was very, very widely sought after in RD. And I was lucky to get a precious copy of that. And um, as I just found out, um, Donald's currently working on the next book which is part of the county series as well which which will be on our ma um, and will be co-authored with Owen McGuinness so I know we'll be looking forward to that as well so without further ado I'll introduce and um, I'll leave it over to Donald and Donald's paper today um, is entitled the south and not the north is responsible for partition so over to you Donald okay Tifa, thanks very much uh, we having a little bit of um problems so uh bear with me for a second while i get the uh thing going um now i hope you can see that someone say something yeah that's good donald off you go that's okay yeah all right so uh you're not getting a full screen this is we're having a few technical problems but you're going to see what you see there and um so what i'm going to talk about tonight is um not so much the politics behind the partition, but actually what happened when they decided that Ireland would be part partitioned. And um, so, and the technical and the human cost of this event. So just a small and a short geopolitical geography lesson. Um, Ulster and Northern Ireland is not the same. On the left there, there's a picture of in blue of Ulster, and on the right, it's not Ulster. I don't get Ulster and Northern Ireland confused, um, particularly for someone if you're in the company of someone from Cavan or Monaghan or Donegal, because uh, they're also from Ulster. And uh, if you call Northern Ireland Ulster, you might get a smack in the gob from them. Ulster is the nine county uh, province, uh, Northern Ireland is six counties. But it's often uh, it's an often overlooked aspect of the political partition of Ireland uh, that a customs barrier was introduced by the Irish Free State on the first of April. The mechanics of the establishment of the customs border they were worth looking into uh, because the controls that were introduced on the movement of traffic and people, the hours that they could move and the roads that they could take, the impinged on the everyday lives of thousands of people along the border. Uh, going about their everyday business and the private and the social lives. Uh, it were told it was detrimental to the local e economies. It also gave rise to smuggling as an economic driver. The border made no sense to the local communities. It made as much sense if the land frontier was placed down the middle of O'Connell Street in Dublin, with rules, regulations and penalties if you crossed from one side of the road to the other. Uh, maybe more attention might have been paid to it uh, politically if it had been closer to Dublin. It's curious in one sense that a customs barrier was erected in 1923 because as far as the Irish Free State was concerned, the boundary question had not yet been settled. There were still high expectations of major changes in the placement of the boundary. And the hopes was that the Boundary Commission would make such widespread changes as to render the state of Northern Ireland inviolable. But there's three reasons put forward for the imposition of the customs controls. One, that it was a clear assertion of national sovereignty. The second, that the, the country, the government badly needed cash, and this was a need of getting cash. And thirdly, that it would 
put economic pressure on Northern Ireland, sort of a, an extension of the failed Belfast boycott. And we'll look into these uh, in some detail later on. Um, so when when the um, when the things were announced, when the imposition of the border was announced, of the customs control was, was announced, James Craig, who is the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, responded that um, uh, the proposal to set up a customs barrier on the southern border would make the south and not the north responsible for partition. There was no such thing as partition if they had not a customs barrier between the north and the south. The customs barrier, if erected, left them Northern Ireland inside the customs union of Great Britain, and the barrier was a barrier against the customs union of Great Britain and not against Ulster. A lot of this talk, even though it is 100 years old, is reflected these days on uh, Brexit. Things, things haven't changed that much. Now, Craig was probably a bit mischievous in what he said, but whether he realised it or not, his comments were prescient. Customs barriers remained between the two states uh, for 70 years, and it was only in the, with the introduction of the single market under the auspices of the European Union on the 1st of January 1993 that they disappeared. And nothing was uh, defined partition in Ireland more clearly and the failure of Irish success of successive Irish governments to deal with it than the chain of customs posts along the frontier. And it is, it is significant that it's only in the context of the European Union and the establishment of a single customs union that customs controls between parts of our, between the both parts of Ireland were finally abolished. It wasn't a part of a bilateral agreement between the two countries or a magnanimous gesture on part of the government of Ireland, but as part of a multilateral trade and economic treaty agreed between 14 member states of the EU. Um, and it's worth noting as well that the disappearance of customs control on the border had nothing to do with the peace process. It preceded the peace process by some years. But was Craig correct? Uh, did customs control uh, establish or, solid or solidify partition? I'm going to answer it, yeah, no, it didn't. Partition, in fact, had been in place for some years, and some of it at Craig's own hands. Now, I'm trying to avoid telling the story of the revolution all over again, but I just want to hit on some of the major points where, uh, which established the, uh, partition, for want of a better word, uh, even before the, um, the free state was set up. Uh, and as early as... There had been talks as far back as 1913 about different aspects of, of partition, but I want to bring it up. I don't, I don't want to go through that. I want to bring it up to date to 1920. And in July 1920, Craig, even though uh, there, was, there, there was no government per se in Northern Ireland, in that part of Ulster, um, Craig and other unionists had a huge sway and influence. And as early as July 1920, James Craig, uh, reactivated the UVF as a police reserve. This is around the time that the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries were coming into the southern part of Ireland. Craig wanted the UVF and he reckoned that they would be a much um, more useful tool against the IRA than uh, an imported police. And in, that's, uh, in that line, he was correct. But he wanted the UVF as a police reserve it eventually turned into also special constabulary, and it was going to be operational in six of the nine Ulster counties. So you're excluding Cavan, Monaghan, and Donegal. So there, if you like, is the first example, if you like, of realistic uh, partition. And as early as September 1920, uh, a, a civil servant called Ernest Clark was appointed to prepare for devolved administration government in Belfast. Uh, on the 20th, 3rd of December, the Government of Ireland Act became law, and this set up um, allowed for uh, the establishment of separate parliaments in Belfast and Dublin. So again, you had partition. And on the 24th of May, the elections took place, and on the 7th of June 1921, Craig was appointed uh, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, and you had the first meeting of the Northern Parliament. Um, on the 22nd of June, the state opening of the parliament. Between July and December 1921, 
the end, the Northern Ireland government opted out of any involvement in the in the treaty negotiations. What we have, we hold. Uh, and in November 1921, Lloyd George was urging them to um, go with the whatever came out of the Anglo-Irish negotiations and to accept an ex a, a subordinate role to a Dublin government, or else, Lloyd George said, there would be damaging customs barrier along the border. So as early as 21, uh, it was recognised officially that uh, there would be a customs barrier between uh, the Irish Free State, as it emerged, and uh, Britain. November, December 21, and January 1922, there was a transfer of powers to Northern Ireland. And uh, after the uh, the declaration, if you like, of the Irish Free State on the 6th of December 1922, uh, in, accordance, and in, in accordance with the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the, uh, the Northern Ireland government opted out of the Irish Free State. So uh, there was plentiful uh, evidence and plentiful rea uh, realistic um, goings on, if you want for, for, for want of a better word, of there was an, uh, a Northern Ireland state had been established. It had its own army at this stage uh, in the guise of the USC. It had its own powers. It had its own um, uh, um, rules and regulations and, and so on. So. Uh, it 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 was established. The, a separate state had been established long in advance of the of the Irish Free State. The um, the IRA um, campaign assisted in, if you like, in the delineation of of the uh, border. Um, and again, I don't want to go through every little thing that happened, but the major points to, to me were that in August 1920, um, Belfast boycott commenced. And um, this was pretty unsuccessful, apart from County Monaghan, um, where uh, Professor Terence Dooley's writing on that is very interesting. And he revealed that it uh, put five, it, it, it was more, in Monaghan, it was more guided by um, private enterprise and wanting to, closed down their um, their competitors and it actually added the Belfast boycott actually added five shillings a week to the uh, average home take home bill of people just buying their normal products which doesn't sound much but when the average um, take home pay was between 15 shillings and a pound a week uh, it is a lot it added 20 25 percent to the take to the take home pay take home wages um, and January to June 1922, there was a border campaign, um, which was supported by the provisional government or elements of it. And this drove the special constabulary into the border areas, again, sealing them off. Um, by, by June 1922, the IRA was effectively defeated and had withdrawn into camps in North Louth. And, uh, is, and it was from these camps that... Uh, at the end of May, beginning of June 1922, that there was a, a lot of exchange of gunfire on on the border between Jonesbury, Ravensdale, Cross Midland, Dungooley, that sort of the whole, very too long, the whole stretch of the border. So this increased, if you like, the, the uh, paranoia and the worry and the sense of being under siege in the Northern government. Um, and so the, the the partition when it happened when it did happen it would have been decided from long time back that uh, count the county basis was going to be um, the basis of partition county barriers were going to be the system and um, this is an example of how silly and how stupid county um, barriers are. Um, this is a pump, as you can see, and it's like any other thousands of uh, community pumps all around the country. Uh, it's 19th century. There's nothing mechanically extraordinary about it. There's nothing aesthetically remarkable about it. But this is, in a lot of ways, a remarkable pump because this pump marks the boundary between Leinster and Ulster. 
And at one stage in the earliest draft of the Government of Ireland Bill, this pump was destined to be situated in the, usual, in the newly created state of Northern Ireland. But under continued pressure from Ulster Unionists, the British government altered the provision of the bill. Uh, and uh, originally the bill as drafted was set to be set up a separate parliament covering all the nine counties of Ulster. Um, there had been various options over the years, uh, four county, six county, nine county, uh, uh, and a county by county vote. But it's not even that straightforward because this marks the boundary between Louth and Monaghan. It marks the boundary between Leinster and Ulster. It also marks the boundary between Louth and Monaghan. And county boundaries are notoriously fickle things. You need a good ordinance survey map and perhaps the services of a professional cartographer to determine county boundaries. Uh, there's usually no physical or demographic logic to boundaries. They cross fields, ditches, hills, mountains, lakes at all angles. Inches and feet can be vital. So when the British government determined that county boundaries were to, were to delimit the jurisdiction of Northern Ireland government, it looked good on paper, but on ground, county boundaries, like the case of the, of the Kalani pump, make little sense. Because the main body of this pump is in County Louth, uh, but the handle is in Monaghan. And for years, according to legend, the maintenance of the pump was in the hands of two local authorities. And so legend has it workmen from Monaghan County Council were dispatched to look after the handle and workmen from County Louth to look after the pump. I don't know how true that bit is. I'm not going to ruin a good story by checking out the facts. But for a decade during consideration, this pump floated in and out of, of partitioned Ireland. Instead of being an inter-county curiosity, this pump could have ended up in disputed territory. Now, there is no doubt that the handle is in Laird, and there is no doubt, sorry, that the main body is in Laird, and the handle is in Monaghan. And where that photograph was taken is in County Loud. Those buildings behind are in County Monaghan. So how? So the problem is when when you say that uh, the boundary is is on the county basis. How do you? The problem is how do you patrol that? How do you uh, look after that? How do you police that? And here's another example of um, the of the of the Loud Armagh border here. And this is a um, this is the M1 heading towards Carrick Arnon. You see that there, and Carrick Arnon is just up here. This is the Dramad area, and there's the M1 heading north. There's the M1 heading south, and the Carrickdale Hotel is somewhere over here. So this is a ramp, and off the motorway, and this you can see here where the, where the border is. This line. And these are county boundaries, and it goes up there, and it crosses over, and God knows what, what. But this is Ireland, and this is Northern Ireland. And again, you have the problem of trying to police this. And I just want to look at this lump here. This is the this is the Protestant Church, the old Protestant Church at the bottom of Jonesborough Hill, and this is the uh, graveyard at the back of the church. So the church is in Northern Ireland and the graveyard, or most of the graveyard, is in Ireland. And this is it from a different from a different angle. There's the church. There's the steeple. Open the door. These trees here are, you know, in the south for one for uh, yeah, probably the south. Or these ones here are anyway. Here's the slip road. This is all the north here. And the south begins again about here, and this is all in the north. How do you police that? Now, when I was a kid, uh, there was dragon's teeth across this road. These were big, big concrete blocks to stop traffic going up and down. And there's a road just around here where if you wanted to go from Jonesboro to Dundalk, you had to come down here, do a six-mile detour, and come in at Killeen and, and carry on. So this was enormously disruptive of normal, uh, everyday uh, life. Um, and this is more than just a curiosity because this was also a, fr a front line. In November 1962, there was an RUC man shot and killed just, just around here. And uh, 
I was out there that day. I was uh, I had a granddad lived in Jonesboro. We used to that was our summer holidays. We used to go to Jonesboro before any, any, anyone ever heard of it. And uh, we were I happened to be out there that day, and uh, I still have vivid memories of walking down Jonesboro Hill. Uh, my mother and my brother, uh, my father, and uh, all all down Jonesboro Hill is uh, marks the 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 Loud Armagh boundary and that ditch or the the wall was lined with RUC men armed with rifles and machine guns and uh, terrifying. But that's the that was the reality and is the reality of the uh, of the border. Very very hard to uh, police and to control. And so, why do you want to? Um, so, just want to say that the the demographics of of the uh, nine county option threaten the stability of Northern Ireland from the off and the possibility of a sizable nationalist opposition in parliament or by using democratic methods nationalists could find themselves actually in government in northern ireland so much safer from the union's point of view was a smaller state with a built-in unionist majority so the three ulster counties donegal and monaghan and cavan were by a whisker excluded from the jurisdiction of the northern irish government and included within the area to be governed uh, from dublin um so from the 1st of april uh 1922 all duties and um functions performed in relation to the levying of taxes were transferred to the provisional government um and special arrangements were put in place uh until the until the 6th of december 1922 that UK customs would continue to collect customs and excise duties, principally because the Irish Free State wasn't set up to do it yet. And by agreement, it, this was extended to the 1st of April 1923. So we, it was known that by 1st of, 19, 1st of January 1920, 1st of April 1923, there was going to be a, a new rules. But what exactly uh, was still open for discussion? And the reason why the Irish Free State decided, the provisional government Irish Free State decided that they were going to take control um, were partly emotional and pra partly practical. Um, the existing rules at the moment was that when taxes were collected, import taxes were, were collected, they were put into a pot and then they were distributed, they were to be distributed between the three countries, the uh, Great Britain, Northern Ireland and the and the Republic, but how they were to, to, to be distributed was was going to be problematical. Uh, in the end, the one year that they did did it, they, they did it on um, uh, as a percentage of the of the overall population. Um, but um, that it it the feeling that um, the Irish Free State was waiting for handouts from Britain was very very strong, and they wanted to get rid of that. And a huge thing all along was, and why they didn't, much like the Home Rule Act of Home Rule Bill of 1914, was that they didn't have uh, economic financial independence. And it was a very, very strong feeling that an independent country should control its own finances. Uh, again, you hear reflections of this in Brexit. Um, it, the, the government denied that there was any... Uh, uh, thought about that it was that this was for protectionist reason or for trade war reason to dislodge the Northern Ireland economy. This was they said purely for their own uh, survival purposes. This was at the the tail end now of 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 the civil war at this stage, and government ta in taking tax was somewhere between twenty eight and thirty million pounds. Unbelievable. But the army was taking up uh, the expenditure on the army was anything between seven and ten million. The cost of the civil war, apart from any of the damage that it's done, but actually running the civil war and running the army was enormous. It was crucifying the um, the government. So they needed they needed control of their own money, and this was a way to get it. They needed the flexibility to be able to decide their own taxation levels. Um, 
but they they also knew that if 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 this happened if if they uh, brought in uh, took control of their own customs duties that this was going to uh, uh, impose elaborate customs checks and they so they said it it had to go ahead they had um they did consider alternatives uh like staying where they are and uh maybe uh there was a serious um assumption that or a plan that maybe the northern ireland government would accept the taxes rates applied in the free state rather than the in the in great britain they thought that that might be a serious one but of course it never would but the problem with the with the, any alternative that they thought of was that uh, that it, uh, it implied acceptance by the free state of existing British tariffs and the administrative system. They were very sensitive. All during the civil war, they were accused of being the the, the, the handmaidens, if you like, of, of the of the British government, and they, they wanted to shake off that. Also, they were worried about the um, the boundary commission if, if they imposed. A customs boundary uh, that um, it might weaken their case against anything that the Boundary Commission, whenever it sat, would come up with. And also, if they thought that the Boundary Commission was going to sit somewhere sometime close, sometime soon, they would hold off. But there was no uh, sign of the Boundary Commission at that at that stage. So this is. Uh, February 1923, and, and, and this was a briefing to the government, and um, Liam, Liam, uh, Liam Cosgrave, the president of the, of the Executive Council, in a handwritten note said, wrote, establishment of, of Customs Frontiers not to be postponed 14th of February 1923. So that was the decision. And um, where are we now? The the first the, the first announcements of, of, of how customs control would work were announced on the I think it's the tenth of March, but and they were dealing with uh, cross channel um, uh, boats and passenger traffic and uh, freight traffic. On the twenty third of March, they made the announcement of how uh, cross border uh, traffic would be um, dealt with. And it started off, as you see here, pending a decision as to the future of a boundary line, pending a decision as to the future boundary line, a temporary frontier will be placed along the boundary line between the six northern and the 26 southern counties. So it was very much seen as a temporary uh, job, this. It wasn't intended at that time uh, that this was going to run forever. Um, and so they they went through the various rules and regulations, uh, which I'm not going to go through. But it the main thing was that in in the in the whole genre of customs law, that the importation and exportation of all merchandise is prohibited except by such routes and during such hours as may be approved. So in other words, you could only import goods and export goods through approved. Uh, stations and at approved times and if you were found outside of those times or outside of those approved routes uh, the goods that you were carrying were deemed to be contraband and uh, so in other words you had to prove that this that the stuff you were carrying was um, duty paid otherwise uh, it would be seized so in other words you you, you were guilty until proven you had to prove yourself innocent um, and this is the beginning of your baggage allowances. Um, and the, the, the part of the um, the uh, instructions where was said that while in practice duty is not charged on small quantities of dutiable goods carried by travelers for personal consumption during a journey, under the, the law, duty is chargeable on any quantity of an article liable to customs duty, however small. And no person has any legal right to exemption from duty. So uh, the the Northern, the uh, Belfast Newsletter picked this up and put it under the headlines: "Sandwich not dutiable." In other words, you could, if you you really could, you could pack a sandwich for your 
while you travel, but don't pack two sandwiches. It might be too much. Um, so you could bring in, in your bag a small amount to get you through the day. But uh, this is before you, you're not allowed your two bottles of whiskey or uh, whatever is 100 and something pounds worth of uh, other goods. You were allowed your sandwich and a cup of tea and a flask of tea at the most. And the Belfast, uh, the reaction, there was a very negative reaction from uh, Northern Ireland. The Belfast newsletter uh, said it was attempting to create a scare in Northern Ireland um, uh, to impress uh, Ulster people with the desirability of coming into the free state. Uh, and they warned that an embargo or duties on British and Northern Ireland goods would lead to retaliation which would injure the Irish Free State manufacturing. Merchants in Dundalk were unimpressed as well. Um, it said that there was, it would result in hopeless confusion and very serious delay to goods crossing the frontier and would be most detrimental generally to business and lead to further serious employment. The, the Dundalk and County Loud generally was in a big uh, slump, economic slump at this stage, and this was... Uh, this was going to put, be the icing on the cake, people feared. Um, Dundalk Linen Company uh, in 1923 made a case against uh, the imposition of, uh, of, of customs uh, regulations. It said the duties would make the operation of a linen manufacturing concern in Dundalk next to impossible. It used to do a certain amount of work in Dundalk, send it up uh, to... Lisbon, I think, to do further processing and then back again uh, to finish. So they said this kind of uh, putting customs controls on the movement of such goods would make uh, would make it next impossible to um, continue in, in operation. And I said that at the moment, over 50% of this plant was lying idle. The erection of a tariff wall on the border would simply be the last straw. Eight years later, it was still on the ghost. It was thriving behind uh, the customs. And it was part of a lobby which uh, petitioned the Tariff Commission for the imposition of a 33% tariff on the importation of linen goods. So it had learned uh, that the, the uh, protection of the customs uh, legislation, they could flourish behind it. And they did flourish. They, they, they survived as a manufacturer until a disastrous fire in 1965. Um, P.J. Carroll's, the uh, tobacco manufacturer, also lobbied against the imposition of um, the uh, levies. I said uh, they threatened that they would drop their business outside the state altogether or set up a manufacturing plant outside the state. Of course, a large amount of P.J. Carroll's uh, stuff went for export. And if, this, and if they did set up a plant, numbers employed in the dock would be reduced by half. Um, P.J. Carroll survived until 2003, I think it was, another 70 years. They, in 1923, they opened a manufacturing plant in Liverpool. 31, they opened in Newry. They continued to thrive in um, Dundalk. Um, they opened a brand spanking new factory in the 1960s. It's now part of DKIT. They were bought out by Rotmans in 1991. And which merged with Amer with British American Tobacco in 1999, and finally it was a very 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 small clog in a huge uh, machine, and it finally closed its manufacturing plant in 2003. So PJ Carroll survived uh, for for 80 years, 80 years uh, after um, after 1923. Now PJ Carroll's were doing a solo run. The the tobacco tobacco manufacturer of Ireland. Um, dismissed P.J. Carroll's objections, which they said were made behind fellow manufacturers back without consultation. And uh, they, the back of manufacturers of Iron said that, they, that uh, the tariffs would mean that they would um, get uh, at least 1,000 jobs, new, new jobs in the tobacco trade in a very short time. Um, almost immediately, but there were definitely casualties uh, at the time. Now, whether how much of this can be assigned to the border and the imposition of duties uh, is problematical. The dock distillery closed within a week of um, the uh, the border being imposed, 
and um, putting 150 men out of work. The, the, the distillery had been in decline for some years. It was bought in 1912 by Scottish distillers. Um, and it had closed in 1921 because of trading difficulties. Uh, and at that time, there was free trade between Great Britain and, and Ireland. Reopened in January 1924, but finally closed in 1925, October 25. The Scottish distillers actually owned four other, other distilleries in um, Ireland. Uh, one in Dublin, Phoenix Park, and three in Northern Ireland. The one in Dublin closed in 1921, and the three in Northern Ireland uh, were closed by 1929. So if the, the Dundalk facility was closed because of economic disadvantage imposed by the border, then you would have supposed that the three in Northern Ireland would have been safe as they had access to, you know, to the United Kingdom market and, and subsidies. So it's, it, um, it's a it's the case to be proven whether, in fact, the border was responsible, the imposition of the border was responsible for the closure of Dundalk Distillery. Another apparent victim was uh, Castle Bellingham Brewery. Uh, this closed at the end of April 23, only a couple of weeks after the imposition, and um, it closed and the loss of 53 people uh, lost their jobs. Um, and it was reported at the time that it was... Um, that they were cut off from their traditional market in Northern Ireland. But at the annual general meeting of the company in October 23, uh, no specific reason for the closure was given. And uh, two other breweries in the county, the Great Northern and McArdle Moor, continued to trade profitably, even though, again, they were cut off from a uh, large part of their um, base in Northern Ireland. Um, so a, a, a contributory factor in the closure of uh, the Bellingham Brewery may have been that Milestone House, which was very close by, was burned by uh, by the IRA just a month earlier in February 1923. And it seems to have very much disturbed the manager of um, uh, the Castle Bellingham Brewery, Charles Thornhill, and his family, so much so that they left the area almost immediately after the fire. So that may have been a deciding factor in, in um, the closing down, the loss of, of, of senior management. Now the evidence, to me, the evidence is not convincing that the establishment of the, cost, of the customs border in itself was responsible for the economic difficulties experienced in Laos during this period. There were many, many other reasons. Um, and in fact, if the boundary was not the prime reason for the economic decline during the 20s, some commercial entity benefit from it. As soon as customs duties were imposed, a differential occurred in the prices of some items, some items in the jurisdictions, primarily in tobacco, which remained cheaper in Northern Ireland. And the temptation was, therefore, that tobacco would be smuggled from Northern Ireland, both in small quantities for personal use and for larger uh, quantities that would be sold in profit um, in the free state. Uh, this is the map of the Armagh Loud, Loud uh, frontier, and I'll, ex I'll explain the red and the, the red squiggles in, in a second. Um, but for our purposes here, this broken red line, that is the land frontier. Uh, this is the land frontier as proposed by the, by the Boundary Commission, if it had been in, implemented. The uh, county level would have gained this amount of land. Um, going up to Lisley and Cullihanna, but we wouldn't have got Camlock or Belake or Yuri. Um, we would have got Fork Hill and Cross, but then you'd be glad to hear them, and Jonesboro. Um, so this is the land frontier from uh, from uh, Carlingford Lock over to uh, County Monaghan. This is the, here's the Monaghan border here. And I've counted, I think uh, there's something like 16 or 19 crossing points on reasonably good roads uh, between the two points. Um, and as the, as the UK was, um, Ireland, was the Irish Free State's biggest trading partner, the imposition of duties was going to affect trade with that country to the greatest extent. And to collect the customs duties, the existing Free State Customs Force needed to be expanded 
and redirected. Up till now, the Customs Service only dealt with maritime imports and exports through a limited number of ports that had been approved for that purpose. Uh, and where uh, trade and passengers were coming in from Ireland, from Great Britain, no controls were in force. As such, custom controls on the movement of goods and people into Ireland was low key and relatively straightforward. From the 1st of April, the Customs Service was required to control what was for them a new phenomenon, which was the land frontier. Uh, and customs duties formed a quarter of the government's annual tax state. And this frontier was with the largest trading partner. So therefore, the efficient control of the border was essential to the protection of the state's revenue base. Now, it's a difficult logistical problem to control a land frontier. The frontier between uh, the north and south stretches from from Laird to Donegal and meanders some 270 miles through fields, rivers, lakes, forests, villages, diagonally and horizontally across roads, farmyards and gardens. The strategy on the level of control imposed on a frontier is based on whether the risk is considered to be based on security, which you would have seen perhaps in in, in, in the during the Cold War between uh, East and West Germany, for instance, or fiscal or fiscal considerations, or a combination of both. Now, both administration exercised border controls by a combination of rules, regulations, and administrative procedures aimed at collecting duties and trade statistics on imports and exports, which were to be channeled through mutually approved crossing points. Goods that crossed the frontier points other than those were considered to be contraband goods are liable to seizure and the, um, the importer liable to prosecution. Um, so in the south, of course, the, the control of the of the border rested with the revenue commissioners and through them the customs and excise. In Northern Ireland, customs stations were established on the larger crossing points for the facilitation of trade, taking duty, taking entries, customs entries, and were manned by customs officials who were uh, appointed uh, from London. But patrolling on the northern side of the frontier for smugglers was done by the Royal Ulster Constabulary, and they were duly commissioned to carry out customs functions uh, by the Customs and Excise. And this arrangement was to continue in Northern Ireland until 1951. So that led, of course, to one huge difference between the Northern Ireland Customs uh, patrolling and the South, was that on the north, the, um, the RUC were, of course, armed and in the south the customs uh, and the customs patrolmen were not comparatively speaking but uh, both government um opted for a relatively open border it was physically possible uh, at certain times uh, al albeit illegal to cross the border at any point um neither administration opted to physically seal the border with barbed wire and tangled with entanglements and cordon sanitaire on both sides. Now that varied, because uh, like I said earlier, I can remember Dragon's Teeth at the bottom of Jonesboro Hill in the in the late in the late fifties, early sixties. They were they were dug up just in time for the trouble to start up again in nineteen sixty eight. Um, so in nineteen in in County Loud, the border was controlled by a series of patrol stations, which are these blue things here. Didn't come out too well, but I hope you can see them. These were patrol stations as opposed to these road stations, which is where the, uh, you could legitimately import and export your goods and yourself for that matter. Um, now these patrol stations were little more than huts, galvanized huts. Um, and you can see they didn't weather too well, especially if someone put uh, a bomb under them. Uh, the one at Anavaki was blown up within a couple of weeks. I don't think this is Anavaki, but it's the same effect. So just going back to the previous one, there was one at um, here just around the the Omeet district. Uh, this is at uh, bu, 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 Mount Pleasant. Uh, this is um, oh, I have it written down somewhere. Anyway, you get the gist. Um, this is on the road. This is Anavaki, and this is inside. Um, uh, this is a Cullerville on the southern side of, of uh, Cullerville. Um, 
So, Carrick Allen in the dear dead days, and um, I mean the, the examination. This is a setup, of course, photograph, and this car is getting a proper examination. Is point and plugs have been done definitely. Um, so the 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 approved points of, of examination were um, at um, Ferry Hill or Omeath. Uh, railway traffic was examined at Greenore Station. Uh, road traffic again was at examined at Carrick Arnon. Uh, coming from Uri and coming from from Armagh was examined at Drumbilla. And railway traffic at Belfast at Dundalk was examined at Mount Pleasant. And when that station was closed, it was examined at Dundalk Rail. Um, and on the northern side, a hundred. Mean, meanwhile, a hundred yards away, you had the Northern Ireland Customs, and so their their examination posts were more or less equivalent uh, to ours. Apart, for instance, uh, Armagh to Dundalk, the um, their examination was at Newton Hamilton. The argument there was they were examining goods that didn't need it. It didn't need to be at the at the land frontier. Um, and uh, but nevertheless, they had one at Killeen examination post at Killeen, um, and so on. The, the railway Dundalk to Belfast was examined at Gorowood, a new railway, and the Green Ore to Newry was at uh, Newry. Um, now it was not permitted to import goods other than at these stations or outside the hours of 9 to 5 or at weekends or at public holidays. There was an exemption for farmers who had land straddling the border. They could walk their livestock across the border. They or their servants, which was a nice little uh, insight into um, attitudes at the time. They could walk them across, but they couldn't put them on a, on a lorry or a trailer and transport them. So it was you could walk the border you know, purely for your own reasons. Foot traffic was also exempted from restrictions and like the case of farmers permitted very local, very limited local travelling, particularly in schools. And there was a special pass for priests, doctors, nurses who crossed the border in the course of their duty only. They were not allowed to cross for their personal reasons. They were not allowed to carry passengers. Now, these rules and regulations imposed uh, enormous pressures on locals. Uh, like I said, and I will re re repeat again, uh, the county boundaries made no sense locally. And so the, and to suddenly have these controls on where you could go and what you could do and to say if you wanted to go from um, Jonesborough to Dundalk, you had to make a six-mile uh, roundabout um, uh, journey up to Killeen and in and in through Carrick Arnon. It made absolutely no sense uh, from an emotional point of view. From a control of the border point of view, of course it did. Um, so it was particularly burdensome on, 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 uh, local, on local people and very quickly people got, um, it affected the attitude, if you say, towards, um, towards the border and towards the enforcement of the border. But it was effective, uh, and these are just uh, quick figures. Um, in, in in the last year of of um, if you like, where the money went to Britain, uh, customs duties collected was two point one million, excise fifteen point two million. We do just leave it, concentrate on those. On the first year of the operation of uh, um, of the new system. 8.1 million uh, was collected in customs duties. Excise slumped to 9.2 million. And you see in 1925, um, the figures 7.4, 7.5 million. Now, the reason why the excise duty slumped was because most uh, excise goods like spirits and tobacco and beer, they're held in a warehouse. You pay duty coming out of a warehouse. If you you, if this if the product is going for consumption at home, you pay duty. If it's going to be exported, you don't pay duty. So because most of Irish excise uh, products were actually being exported to the UK, they didn't have to pay duty on them. So 
that's why you had a big slump in excise charges because this stuff was now going to a foreign country. You didn't have to pay duty on it, and this was a huge part of the uh, of the Irish market. Um, so uh, the total revenue receipts in 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 1923 were 23 million. Revenue receipts in 1924 were 30 million, and 1925 were 26 million. So the revenues held up. This is really all the government wanted. Uh, but this is why the customs duties were so important to them. Um, and um, so the importance of customs duties to the exchequer, they can't be overemphasized. They were relatively easy to collect. Most customs were collected at stations where goods were imported, such as ports and approved border crossing points. And the purpose of customs patrols was to protect an important source and to act as a deterrent. Penalties for breach of customs laws were, were severe. Uh, there was a standard penalty of three times the duty paid value on items seized. So if you bought a bike in Uri, for instance, for £10, and the duty was £5, and you were caught, the penalty imposed was £45, plus you lost your bike. Um, and there was a commercial factor to smuggling. And one of the first cases uh, that was prosecuted, uh, Lawrence Hoy, who owned a shop in Bridge Street, he was detected crossing the border after, after the approved hours with nine pounds of cigarettes and eight pounds of confectionery. Nine pounds of cigarettes is roughly about 3,000 cigarettes. So obviously he owned a shop and uh, he had 3,000 cigarettes. And um, so he wasn't going to smoke all them himself. Or he wasn't going to eat all them sweets himself. So it's obviously a commercial import. So he was fined uh, 10 pounds, 10 shillings for smuggling, and a pound for crossing the frontier after the improved hours. And the judge who tried the case adopted a severely moralistic uh, tone in dealing with Hoy. He said, hitherto we have been paying our taxes to a foreign government, but now there is no excuse, and it would be well that people should have clear ideas that they are morally bound to pay the taxes, and failure to do so is a matter for Catholics in confession. Um, so obviously members of the Church of Ireland didn't uh, smuggle. It was a great comfort to them. Of course, admonishment of, on religious and patriotic grounds made absolutely no difference to those who engaged in smuggling, whether for private or commercial reasons. Smuggling continued and increased. Therefore, relatively, relatively minor infractions, such as smuggling of a bicycle for personal use, were treated by customs with the same gravity as smuggling for commercial gain. Newspapers are full of customs prosecutions for cases which now to us seem pretty petty. Customs front, uh, frontier controls were seen by the public to be invasive and also petty. And unlike those, the ports had to be dealt with every day by people going about their everyday business living in the frontier zone area. Unlike the Gardaí who appeared on the scene around the same time, Customs staff never attained the same high degree of public acceptance. Getting one across on the customs man became a regional sport with uh, county finals in, in, the, in the autumn. Smuggling, whether it was petty or commercial, rapidly became a way of life along the frontier. Um, smuggling, the, the, the figures themselves are, inter are, are interesting. Again, in the first year of the operation of the new system, 425 cases of smuggling. And these are for the whole country, not just at the land frontier. And um, there's 202 cases on involved excise. Of, of the 425, 202 involved excise goods, which is basically tobacco and um, booze. And um, 264 pounds of tobacco Receives, which is the equivalent of about of 88,000 cigarettes, 60 gallons of spirits, and 570. There was 93 court cases. 24, 25, you see the cases go up to 1,500 cases of seizures. 25, 26, 2,600, 4,400. So the cases are going up, they're up, up and up and up over the years, and it's the same. Uh, it's the, it's the same stuff all the time, tobacco, cigarettes, and spirits, booze as the main thing. 
And just for comparison's sake, the latest um, revenue um, annual report, um, there was 20,509 seizures made by customs during 2020, uh, of which 6,000 related to excise goods. Uh, there's 3,000 pounds of tobacco. This is actual tobacco. This is roll your owns, and, and um, I don't think anyone smokes anymore or does pipes anymore. Uh, so this would be roll your own tobacco. Uh, 48.2 million cigarettes, 150,000 gallons of uh, spirits, and those 269 court cases and 1.6 million pounds um, in uh, penalties imposed by the courts. So it's still big business, and um, that, again, that's 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 for all over the country. And, uh, and now, of course, they have a uh, massive amount of drug seizures and so on. There's other things that that um, that they do. Uh, so I, I I mentioned that getting one across the customs man became a sort of a national sport, and we all did it. whether it was for small things or larger things. And uh, the customs man was not a very popular man around the place, except if you were doing bed and breakfast. So the stories about customs men and so on, they're, they're, they're uh, apocryphal, really. And this is one I've heard so often. I, I put it up just in case someone decided to tell me it again tonight. So <clears throat> other thing, did it really happen? Part one. And Mr. Man, I've changed the name to protect the guilty. He went to a customs man at Carrigan, said he wanted to bring in a bag of sawdust for his chicken house. Would that be okay? It would, said the customs man. Well, listen, said Mr. Man, I'm a bit nervous. When are you next on duty? And I'll make sure to bring it in. On the agreed day, Mr. Man brought along his bike with the bag of sawdust, got a nice wave from the customs man, and off he went. But it wasn't the sawdust Mr. Man was bringing in. It was the bike. Now, I've heard that story so often. In fact, the first time I ever heard that story, it was in relation to a guy who wanted to bring a, um, something out of the of the Great Northern Railways works. He wanted to bring a wheelbarrow out of the Great Northern Railways. And I've heard variations on that story, you know, so often. In fact, a couple of years ago, a, a fella stopped me to tell me it and that it happened to his uncle or a granduncle or someone. I'm not saying it didn't work, didn't happen, but... Uh, I also heard it in relation to P.J. Carroll's and um, Guinnesses. Yeah, Guinnesses as well in, in Dublin. Now, if you're if this happened to your uncle, I absolutely um, believe you. And on the other side, there's these. On, on, on the custom side, there's this story. Women bring in more butter than they're allowed would hide it on the person, to stuff it in their dresses or whatever. So they were invited into customs hut, the place close to a roaring fire. Before too long, the butter would melt and render it useless. The women were then sent on the way without a word been said. Now I've heard this on both sides. I've read it, seen it written down on both sides of the border. I don't know if it happened or not. Uh, but these are the these are the stories. Um, so I'm going to finish up uh, just in a, in a second or two. Um, at the beginning of this uh, decade, the constitutional settlement desired by most nationalists was the United Ireland of the Home Rule, and by most unionists was the United Ireland of the Westminster Rule. Partition was the inevitable result of the impossibility of reconciling the irreconcilable. The resulting settlement produced mu two mutually antagonistic and inward-looking states separated by a land frontier that served as a constant reminder of political failure. The practical outcome of the revolution for Louth was that partition cleaved the county from a major portion of its economic base. Families and communities were divided by an international boundary that made no more sense to the people of the area than it would to Dublin or as if it was drawn down the middle of O'Connell Street. Smuggling, whether it was petty or commercial, rapidly became a way of life along the frontier with the borderlands unjustly becoming synonymous with illegality. The exploitation of the border for profit went far beyond the cliched image of a 
contraband litten, laden lorries negotiating the divided fields and roads in the counties adjoining the border. Businesses and financial institutions learned quickly to turn differing fiscal regulations to their advantage. No doubt many of those engaged in these practices would have professed aspirations to United Ireland. But as the ways in which the border became could be exploited became more widespread and sophisticated, perhaps they whispered under their breath in the manner of St. Augustine's prayer for redemption, but not yet. So was James Craig right. Did the Irish Free State make a land frontier out of the border? There's no such thing as partition if they had not a customs barrier between North and South. He was being mischievous. Partition had been established de facto in 1920 when the UVF turned into the U also Special Constabulary and preparations went underway for the establishment of a government in Northern Ireland even before the, re the relevant legislation had been passed. Spurred on by the activities of Southern-based IRA units, the border became a point of confrontation between the provisional government supported IRA and the also special constabulary between January and July 1922. Two hostile states faced each other down. So the border by the end of 1922 was well established and so was partition. What the imposition of duties did was to ensure that when peace came and the armed forces on both sides withdrew, invasive and intrusive customs controls would remain in state. It could have been otherwise if the Irish Free State remained within the Customs Union with the UK. And this all seems so familiar now. It's all been rehashed all over again with Brexit. But that was never going to happen. The Irish Free State had to establish its own financial independence. The unfortunate consequences of it was a fiscal border that remained in place for 70 years. So was Craig right? Well, no, and maybe yes, but not completely. Thank you. That's me finished. I think I'm back in now, Donald. Thanks so much okay. for an absolutely fascinating paper. There's so much there from the Kalani pump to the sandwiches and the border to the, the sport of getting the one, one over the customs man. So um, I, I'm sure uh, many of our listeners enjoyed it as much as I do. And just the amount of detail and research involved uh, is really mm -hmm. something else. Um, I'll give anyone a chance to put some questions into the chat now if you want. And I actually have one here, I think from Barry. So maybe I'll start off with that one and I have a few um, lined up as well and there we've got the pump and the butter made it for me that that account of the women being expected to sit by the fire so that the butter would melt that's just really remarkable do you think it's more more fiction or fact what would your what would your um idea be donald um i could tell you but i have to shoot you how about that uh, <laughs> i don't know it, it's 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 possibly true but i mean you hear them talking about it and um it's possibly true but you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good story anyway, you know. The threat was there anyway. Yeah. Those nice customs uh, men um, wouldn't have something like that, you know. <laughs> and that was actually one of the things, actually, before I go to the question from Barry, just when you said about the RUC being armed and that obviously being different sides of the border, what, what were the implications, do you think, of them ha being armed? It was a psychological more than actual... Uh, well, well, it's it's the the RUC was was an armed body, anyway, like the RIC had had been. So the, the RUC was the Irish government made a dis deliberate uh, decision back in 1922 that the Gardaí were not going to be armed, um, and uh, and they have stuck to that decision for a hundred years. Uh, the Customs Service, the British Customs Service, was traditionally unarmed. Now, there had been a revenue police back in the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, which was an armed body. They were, dis they were disbanded, I think, in the 1850s. But that was a fully armed um, uh, body of men. Um, but by, by 1920, it, they, they were civil servants. They were, un they were unarmed, if you like, civil servants. There was no need for, a, uh, for an armed service up to 1922. And um, there's no, there was no reason why it, it should be armed after, afterwards. They were essentially 
civil servants in 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 in, uh, in in uniform with extraordinary powers. Now there was one case of it actually of a customs man who was armed. He was a former IRA man. He was he was uh, one of um, um, the one of the Cork IRA, and he joined the civil he joined the customs service. I'm not quite sure when, uh, and he was stationed in in Dundalk. Because of his uh, background, he was allowed to carry a a handgun, uh, and he carried it on duty. And uh, legend has it that he put a bullet in the, in the engine block of a lorry who's trying to jump the border at, at Omid. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a good story. Uh, but he, he uh, but he he was allowed, and there might have been one or two others who were allowed to carry guns because of their um republican background if you like uh but yeah. uh other than that uh no they 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 um they have not i mean there's people there in the audience who know, know more about this later they have been it is a situation where you can get in a very sticky sticky situation you just have to be able to get yourself out no one would want to want to want an armed custom service yeah Absolutely, but it, it is quite a remarkable when you think of the contrast, isn't it? And yeah, um, bet yeah. between North and South in that context, and um, intrigued that there were a few exemptions down south as well for um, yeah. the Republican gunmen got got a, got a, a a free pass for a while. Um, so yeah. Barry has a question here, and he says, um, "Excellent talk, Donald. Considering they were cutting one country into two states." Why do they choose county boundaries knowing all the difficulties it would create with regards to policing it, especially since, as you said, the initial boundary was intended to be temporary? Were there any suggestions at either government level to ignore county lines and use top topographical features, rivers, hills, mountains, etc.? The, the county boundaries were handy because there was already a local government system in place. Um, to 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 run them like to run all the local local services and by and large they were self-contained uh, some counties uh, shared um county workhouse uh, facilities and and uh, and so on but by and large the attraction of the county basis was that they were self-contained uh if if you start drawing a line down the middle of Armagh, for instance uh where where does what go uh does Armagh say you say you'd subdivide it Armagh, does the southern part of Armagh does it go to County Monaghan, does it go to County Louth? Um and um and that's say what was was one say one of the problems with, with the boundary commission things. Where where would said Armagh go? Um so there was no there was some talk of of, of maybe um it a, a, a it, a vote system going on, but it, it would have been too big. Uh, how do you how do you do it and um, do it by parish, do it by land, or you know? So they just decided that the the county boundary was um, the most efficient because you already had an existing local government system there. Now the the, the real problem was which counties are you going to uh, going to involve. It would have been nice if they, if they could have just drawn straight lines because the county boundaries actually make no sense whatsoever, you know. Uh, and like I said, the the, the Killani pump and, and and the thing at the and the Jonesborough Hill are examples of of that. You you can't you can't control those, and uh, so and it has caused huge huge problems. Yeah, brilliant. Donald, I'm going to throw you a tricky question. If this is okay, but one of the things that kind of struck me is in terms of economics, you, you've looked at the, the devastating effect, I suppose, for Titian, and I was struck by um, the fact that the Dundalk distiller closed within um, a few months of the border, within a week, I think, actually, you said, of the border being um, established. But then you've also pointed to the fact that there was also advantages that businesses could um, tap into and, um, and situations that they took advantage of. So I think if we took a step back, what would you say... Was the impact of the border was it more negative or um, was it more positive in terms of economic impact? Um, it, I think, I think, I think the jury is kind of out on 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 broader economic um, 
um, questions of whether it had a negative impact or not. You had big companies like PJ Carroll's thrived, um, Harp Lager, um, you know, um, and what what happened, I think, was um, some counties just got were maybe too far away from Dublin, like Monaghan, Donegal. You know, the further away, the further away you got from Dublin, seemed that the less chance of economic development. Um, but where 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 it where that falls down though is that um, on the the day to the day to day living um, is in like I I I came back to Dundalk in nineteen ninety three, and in nineteen ninety three there wasn't there was hardly a petrol station open in Dundalk. Everyone was going north to buy petrol, and there were queues of petrol, and there was people coming from deep within the country to go up north to buy petrol. And um, I was talking to one garage owner who said, like, he was he used to be crucified. People driving up an area on empty tanks, stopping in his place to buy a pound's worth of petrol just so they could get across the border. Uh, and um, overnight, then, sometime in the mid 90s, the uh, and petrol stations around the north that, that were existing, they, they were really run down and, and, and bad looking. Overnight, there was a budget in the UK and petrol in the UK became more, more expensive. And suddenly the the trade changed and everyone was buying petrol at home and then people were coming down from the north to buy, to, to buy petrol. So that was very cyclical. And you have you had people going north to buy stuff, especially up to Newry, uh, in retail outlets, um, partly because of, because of tradition, partly because of price. Uh, and so the, the shops down here suffered very badly beca because of that. Um, and then other times, sometimes they, not an awful lot, but sometimes things are get 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 cheaper here. So, um, so the the, pro the proximity of the border and the proximity, say, of Newry has been a double edged sword, I think. You know, um, and um, but I guess you 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 people are going out because because that's where they do the shopping. There's no big thought done to, gone to it either, you know. Um, so, and, and like, if you think about it, the big Newry is the closest town to 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 Dundalk. Um, it's only 10, 12, 12 miles away. You're down there in ten minutes. It takes you half an hour to get to Drada, for instance. So, and especially in this half of the county, we tend to look north uh, more than we would look south. So, it's it's part of a natural hinterland, and it always has been. Um, so it, it's um, so it's been a, a, a double-edged sword. The, 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 the town, this town of the Dock, it goes up and down economically, depending on 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 on, uh, on how on budgets and tax rates and another thing. And government doesn't really care all that much. It, they only seem to wake up when they start running buses from Cork and Dublin up to now, which is what happened during the seventies and eighties, and they brought in. Uh, arrangements to to uh, counter that. That's when they brought in the forty eight hour rule, for instance. You know, because they were running uh, buses up from Cork and God knows where. You know, so sorry, I'm, I'm rambling, but it's not it's not really a straightforward question. Oh no, so, yeah, no, it's a it's a tricky one. I'm sure yeah. I know myself for nipping up to Newry, um, and I actually have family in Balik who ran a petrol pump 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 on the main street in Balik and from Anna for years, so they very much yeah. know the cyclical. Um, uh, shifts, yeah. I suppose, uh, with petrol, it was over to mm. Ballyshannon and then um, if it wasn't their year, you know, so there, there's definitely a, a lack of security yeah, yeah. there, isn't it, for businesses that you, you, you could yeah. be doing well oh, one year and then yeah. Yeah. it could totally flip yeah. the next year. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the economic factor, but that actually brings us to my next question, because even though your paper was on economics, you were pointing to the, I think you mentioned at one point, point the emotional point of view. What, what was the emotional point of view or the emotional or the psychological consequences of partition then, aside from the economics? Uh, well, it's a strange, that's again, it's a strange one. I, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Um, you know, people just get on with things. You know, when you, you, you had the, the political um, partition, but and and that has an effect, 
but then people get on with their lives and they'll, they'll continue to go up, you know, to the county finals, whatever, whoever's playing. They'll continue to do their shopping. Um, they'll continue to socialise on both sides of the border because that's what that's that's where their cousins are. They come down to work. They come down from the north to work, but they go down to New York to work, you know. Um, and the, emo the emotional end of it, I think, is that it's a lack of Understanding isn't the word, but it's 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 uh, it's a lack of of knowing that this is actually is you are actually going to a different country. You know, your go your your cousin, your auntie, your mother is now living in a different in a different country, um, so, and that uh, that is a difficult thing to 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 grasp when you know when you have always gone up. To, up to Jones, I had a grand aunt lived in lived in Jones, and my great grandfather lived, lived, lived there. We always went went up there. Suddenly, it's a different country, and and so rather than deal with that, people I think just well ignored it. I think people actually ignored the border insofar as they could. They they um they uh they a bit like. I was trying to think of a of a parallel, and in 1920, 1921, the under under the Doyle, there was sort of a subterranean government set set up, and uh, and the 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 local local governments uh, they um, withdrew recognition from 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 um, the. Uh, Dublin Council uh, administration, and they started doing their own thing, and they withheld rates and and, and uh, so on. And they it was very effective. And how they kind of defeated, if you like, the British administration was there was by ignoring it. And I'm thinking that that in a lot of ways that's how people dealt with the border. They ignored it, and they just got on with their lives. And um. You know, when the, there was hiccups, and then when they could see that they could, you know, that the cigarettes were cheaper up, up in Newry or in Jones, but they went up and they bought the twenty players, you know, and um, so I don't think there was a whole heap of thinking about it. It was just that they uh, adjusted their lives and 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 got on with 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 doing the best that they that they could, um, you know, uh, the GAA stayed the same up in up in this neck of the woods. Our schools still played in Ulster colleges, um, and um, the the uh, diocese remained the same. So many things didn't change. So many things that were important in in life, you know, like the church, like like sport, didn't change. They stayed exactly the same. And it was it was the it was the the uh, the man in the uniform that that uh, changed and this stopped you, you know. Going up to Newry and buying buying something. That's that's where the chain was, and that's where they devoted so much of the time to get around that, you know, and having a bit of a laugh about it too, you know. Um, again, I'm rambling. I'm sorry. No, at all. No, it's all fascinating, isn't it? I've, I have a few more questions for you, but um, if anyone else has any questions, you can put them into into the chat. And there's one here that I'll throw at you now. I don't know if that's okay. Um, so this is just about the policing unit that we were talking about a minute ago. Was there ever any talk of a joint border policing unit in an effort to show some sense of solidarity or unit? Uh, not that I know of. Um, there was, um, again, I, 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 I'm not that familiar with the police and the things, the customs and excise and the things I would be familiar with. Um, but uh, I mean, there was always cooperation, uh, local and um, mm -hmm. things done over the phones and and uh, stuff like that. And there's also there's all um, joint operations and stuff goes on like that. Um, they go on. Some are big, some are some are small. Um, some make the headlines and some don't. That's always mm -hmm. gone on, and probably mm -hmm. always will. Yeah. I was intrigued actually just with the, that that wonderful table you did and the facts and figures and I, I, I was just imagining all the research that must have been involved in that but the fact that you included the figures from 2020 as well as the figures and mm. um, from the 1920s and that there was mm. a similar number of uh, court cases I think with 1926 um, and then mm. last year 19, 2020 was it um, around 269 and 230 cases I think from the notes I have here mm. Um, mm. but I suppose that just brought me up to, to the, the next question 
it's, even when we're looking at history, we're always somewhat looking at history tr through the lens of the present, aren't we? Um, mm. And I think that's very much the case with this paper today. So I was just wondering how do you think that the, a lot of this is topical with debates around Brexit and what do you see even in terms of the future of the border? Yeah, well, the, uh, well <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw that at you. <laughs> I like that last bit, yeah. Um, if I knew that, I'd, I'd invest in a petrol station at a Caracana and hope for the best. Um, the uh, it's 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 difficult. The, the Brexit. I mean, when I was when I was rereading an awful lot of a lot of stuff, the the argument about uh, being a single custom union and it's it. When I first did it, researched it ten years ago, it's sort of a little bit over there, all obscure. But this is exactly what they're talking about now about. Um, whether Northern Ireland should should be in the single customs should should remain in the EU customs union or should stay in the UK customs union, it it it's to our advantage if they went into the EU customs union, and emotionally and probably financially, they the unions at least want to stay in the UK customs union. So these actually and slightly vary, but these are the kind of arguments that went on. In 1922, about should Ireland, should the Irish Free State, stay within the UK uh, Customs Union? It would have made uh, economic sense because you, you, you see from the returns there in 1923-24, um, the actual returns of tax made uh, in the first year of the uh, new system was much as they were under the old system. So. We possibly wouldn't have lost money, um, but it's this. It's it's a it's it's in a it's it's a pride thing that sort of drove uh, the Irish Free State uh, to want to control their own finance. It's a natural thing, as far as possible. Peoples want to control countries. Want to control the, their own uh, their own uh, finances, and. In a major way, that's what drove them. I think in 1923, it it's this. This was the first government that this part of the country had ever had. If you look at it this way, you know, the first democratically elected government. They had to show that they were up to the job, that they were they weren't waiting like little boys to be handed out to be doled out money from from daddy in Westminster. And they had just been through and in the middle of a horrendous civil war, which caused huge reflections on them, on the Irish. And people were saying, we told you, they can't rule themselves. And in a lot of ways, it was a matter of pride. It was a matter of, no, we can do it. And so they wanted to show that they could um, uh, run the economy. Now, in the fashion of the time, it was a it was a very uh, conservative um, economy that they ran, but they weren't unique in in that they were set to balance the books. They weren't unique in in that, um, but um, they did run an economy. Um, they lost sight sometimes of the humanity behind it, but um, so that so the. That I can understand, and I think that it, it, it does reflect in sort of what's going on now. And uh, I don't think you, whether you can draw actual parallels in the decision to be made, I don't know. Um, there's for in, there's really no way, I think, that uh, the things haven't changed so much that the unionists in 2022 are going to take a different attitude than they took in 1922. You know, there was an idea floated around in 1922 that the unionists or the Northern Ireland government might accept the rates, the, t the taxes at the rates declared in the Irish Free State. And that the, uh, they said, well, this will be good for them because we're, because we're all the same country. That was never going to happen, and it's it's never going to happen now either. You know, so there are there are parallels, there are lessons 
from history and so far as be sensible, you know. What what will happen in the future? God knows. Um, I don't think if there's any more, um, is there any more questions? If if there's not, we might wrap up there, Donald. But Thanks that was absolutely much. fascinating. And I think I, um, there's just so much material there. I hope that that's published. And I'm really looking forward to the forthcoming book on Armagh as well, which I think will be of huge interest to, to, to many people uh, watching and listening here. Um, we've got some messages here. Okay. Thank you for a great talk, um, says Maria. Um, but really just uh, um, incredibly detailed re research, Donald. So thanks so much for, 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 for me, I suppose, personally, thanks so much for all of your work on Loud as well, because I think you've really um, opened up the history thanks of Loud much. to so many people. Um, and it's really remarkable. So um, thanks to you for that and looking forward to your work in the future as well. And thanks, thanks for a fantastic much. paper. God bless. And safe home. Oh, you are home, right? <laughs>